Thank you so much, Betsy. Uh, and, and thank you to the museum and all the people on staff who helped make this possible. It's really a wonderful opportunity to, for me to deepen my connection with the collection and for all of us to deepen our connections with each other. And I really appreciate that the museum makes it possible. Uh, let's see, I have a couple of other thanks. I want to thank Bruce Gunther, uh, who retired last fall as the chief curator and the Robert and Mercedes Eichholz Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art. Uh, and I think I have his retirement to thank for the fact that he was able to take time to meet with me and talk about his unique perspective on this piece. He and his partner, Eduardo Vides, donated this piece to the museum. And it's one of, I, I understand, 4,000 pieces that the museum acquired under his tenure, which is just an astonishing legacy. It's really amazing. Um, so after we look at this piece, we're going to go over to the other side of the museum and look at a Korean hat. And I want to also thank Mary Beth Graybill, who's the uh, Arlene and Harold Schnitzer Curator of Asian Art. And she's not retired and, <laughs> um, and still, and, and has many responsibilities and, and still took uh, just enough time to meet with me in that gallery and convince me that you and I know just as much about that hat as she does. It's not her area of specialty and I, I think she couldn't really even understand what I saw in it. <laughs> but uh, I, was, I was really, uh, I am thankful to have met her. Um, and thank you to all of you for taking this time. And uh, I promise that you won't be standing the whole time in the other gallery. There's a little more space and more seats and hopefully more people can sit. Uh, so here's what I'm going to do, just sort of an, a, an outline. I'm going to say a few things about art in general and my background and, and what I bring to looking at art. I'm going to speak about this work in particular, its context with respect to Man Ray's life and the rest of his work and the period that he worked in. Then we're going to move. I'm going to, I'm going to try and keep that all relatively short. I'll have more things to say about it when we're overlooking at the Korean hat, just sort of comparing and contrasting the pieces. But we will then move over to the Korean gallery uh, and, and do kind of the same thing over there. Uh, I want you to ask questions. If there are questions that come up, especially like here, while we have the piece in front of us. Don't save those questions to the end when we can't look at it. Um, but know that I'm gonna try and get us moving sooner rather than later. So just a few words about looking at art in general. I really see art as an invitation and an opportunity to be open and receptive and kind of let down our guard a little bit. I think uh, we so often need to be guarded in our lives. And I guess if I had this in my hand and I was coming at you, you should be guarded. <laughs> but, um, but the way it's displayed here, you, you don't need to be afraid of it. And it's an opportunity, I think, to um, kind of watch how your mind works when you're looking at something new. Where, where does your mind go? Uh, and, and that's part of what I take pleasure in when I look at something new. Uh, as Betsy said, I began my adult life as an engineer. And even, I would say, more than more than the fact that I went to school to study engineering and I worked as an engineer for five years, even before that, I can say that I was raised to be an engineer. <laughs> my family 
my family motto, <laughs> here, here's my family's motto, science and engineering triumph over superstition and fear. <laughs> I think there might be an engineer back here. I saw a little, <laughs> no? <laughs> science and engineering triumph over superstition and fear. So, uh, I mean, I heard that uh, over time and again growing up, and, and I think it helps explain why when I am looking at something new, trying to make sense of something new, the first questions that I ask are, how is it made, how does it work? How does it work, how is it made? Science and engineering. And if it's broken, how did that happen? And how do I fix it? And in fixing it, not just patch it over, but what is the underlying mechanism? And, and is there some weakness in the underlying mechanism? And if so, can we improve on that weakness so that the same thing won't break again? And even beyond that, What would the next weakness be if we improve on that weakness so that doesn't break? What's the next thing that's going to fail? So that's, that's sort of where my mind goes. And I have to say, uh, I'm really grateful for that. I mean, I think I learned all that, that way of thinking well before I went to school to study engineering. That, was, that came from my father very clearly. And, and I really, really appreciate that because I think it applies to so much more than engineering and fixing things. Uh, but it is uh, very specifically a, a way of thinking, one way of thinking, not the only way of thinking. And I have to be very deliberate and set that aside in order to then ask, how does it feel? which in, in my upbringing, and I think maybe many of ours, how does it feel was pretty much suppressed. I think it's, it is suppressed in this culture. Uh, but I think it's a really important place to start. Uh, and I'd like to start there with this piece and ask you all to help me uh, think of what is the first word that comes to mind when I say, how does it feel? And I would love to get like one word from as many people as I can, which I will repeat for the video. Um, just what comes to mind, Peggy? Wince. Wince. <laughs> right. Brutal. Brutal. Sharp. Sharp. Comfort. Comfort. Whoa. Impractical. Impractical. <laughs> Incongruous. Incongruous. Torn. Weighty. Torn. Torn. Weighty. 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 Hot. Strength. Hot. 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 And what's it? Strength. Strength. I would say snag. Snag. Well, Willie called, but that doesn't count. Yeah. Yeah. If you were right up close to it, you might also say, rough, because it's got a very rough exterior. Uh, and I've also felt that it's really stable and balanced. Uh, so a related question to how does it feel, how does it make us feel? And I, I noticed some of the answers kind of were answering that second question, but I'm, I'm open to more answers. One word of answers, how does it make us feel? Puzzled. Rejected. Rejected. Tenuous. Tenuous. Confronted. Confronted. Evasive. Evasive. Amused. Amused. <laughs> yeah. Anxious. That's on my list. <laughs> Confused, amused. I feel pain when I see that and, and fear. Uh, okay, and now here's a third variation on the question. How, how does it feel? How would it feel if it were capable of, 
of, if it were aware of sensation. Imagine like being it. How would it's it feel? Defensive. Defensive. Misunderstood. Misunderstood. <laughs> Fearful of rejection. Fearful of rejection. Don't Bored. touch. Bored. Don't touch. <laughs> ugly duckling. <laughs> I I have on my list strong but masking weakness, guarded and defensive. Yeah. Um, thank you for helping me with that. I think it's a really great place to start. So now I want to say a few things about Man Ray. Uh, yeah. Uh, I would like to get to the title. Okay. I, will, I will get to it. Remind me if I don't. At, at the very end, I'll talk about the title if I don't get to it sooner. <laughs> there is the man himself. <laughs> uh, so Man Ray was born in 1890. Uh, I should preface this. I, I did a little, you know, Wikipedia, surfing the web, et cetera. But the book that I read was his autobiography, which I highly recommend. Fantastic read. He's a great writer, tells great stories. You can't put it down. But you can also tell from the stories that he relates that he is a prankster and a joker, and you can't always believe him. So all of this, I would say, is uh, with a grain of salt. I don't know. You know I, I think he was born in 1890. I, th <laughs> I think. When he was born, he was given the name Emanuel Rednitsky. His parents were Russian Jewish immigrants. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you Bruce. Thank you, Eduardo. Um, his parents were Russian Jewish immigrants. His father worked in a garment factory and did tailoring uh, either out of the home or outside of the home, depending on which text you read. That's two completely different meanings. Uh, Anyway, uh, he would have seen not just his mother with an iron, but his father using an iron equally, maybe more his father. Uh, he got a scholarship to study architecture, uh, which he turned down. He, he chose to become an artist. He considered himself foremost a painter and took up photography as a way to pay the bills did photography and painting and made these Dada objects his whole life. And, but really, he really considered himself a painter foremost and um, specifically chose to, to earn his living with photography so that he wouldn't be shackled by any kind of limitations on what he painted or when he painted or or no market pressures. He was very independent. His, his photography, however, uh, in spite of the fact that he is doing it to make a living, he's also completely pushing the boundaries of the medium and inventing the medium. And at a time when it's not considered a, a form of art, it, he, he is doing work that will end up helping it be seen as, as as a form of art. So, uh, and I think he's, he, so his, his influence on art history is much more, I think, in the realm of photography than painting. But that's not the way he sees it. So the Dada objects, he, he I don't think I mentioned, he was in New York, so he, he grew up in Brooklyn. He met, um, met Marcel Duchamp in the teens mm -hmm. and and became friends, and began making these Dada objects kind of in the, uh, in the wake of, of Duchamp. When, in, in 1921, when, when Duchamp moved back to Paris, he encouraged Man Ray to join him there. He, I think Man Ray felt mis misunderstood in New York and and Duchamp encouraged him that there was a community in Paris that, would, uh, that he would connect with. So uh, he moved to Paris in 21. He took with him a case full of paintings that he had done in New York. And within 
six months of arriving in Paris, he had a show, a painting show. And at the, now we're getting into sort of how this piece came to be. At the, this is the sort of creation myth of this piece. <laughs> uh, at the opening reception for this painting show, uh, Eric Satie shows up, the composer, Eric Satie, who's a generation older than Man Ray and his compatriots, and, and stands out. He's got the white, white beard and the little glasses and the bowler hat, and he really stands out in the crowd. And he wants to engage in conversation with Man Ray about the paintings, but Man Ray is French, is sort of non-existent still, and the gallery is cold, there's no heat, and the conversation's going nowhere. So Satie takes Man Ray out of the gallery, and they go to a cafe nearby and have a few grogs and warm up and loosen up and then head back to the gallery. And on the way, uh, stop, they see, they pass by a shop that has household utensils on display out front. And on the spur of the moment, uh, Man Ray gets Satie to go in the shop with him and help him buy an iron, a box of tacks, a bottle of glue. And they go back to the gallery and he makes this piece and adds it to the show, just like that. <laughs> And it's his intention to draw straws and give it to one of his friends. But before the reception is over, the piece disappears. Oops. And never, never to resurface. He, he thinks one of his friends wasn't willing to leave it to chance, really wanted the piece, and he thinks he knows who took it. But it's <laughs> never, never resurfaced. Uh, he says, oh, no matter, I can make another one. <laughs> So that, and he does many times over his career. Um, I think we're getting close to the end of what I want to say right here. It seems like a very Duchamp sort of piece. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Very Duchamp sort of piece, repeating for the video. Duchampian. Duchampian, yes. And, and that leads me to my next subject, which is to say a little bit about Dada and surrealism and Duchamp's ready-mades that, that sort of led to all of that. Um, in, in Duchamp's case, he's taking ordinary objects and without necessarily making any modification whatsoever, just proclaiming it as art mm -hmm. in the case of the fountain. Uh, it's art if I say it is. Dada evolves out of that, but is really much more proclaiming that it's all nonsense. Uh, for he, or Man Ray is apparently claimed that he didn't understand what the attraction was of this piece later in life. All, all, all of these. Uh, replicas that he made and all of the attention that they got, he, he didn't understand that. All he had done was to take a useful object and make it useless. So that was one of the sort of fundamental ideas behind Dada, taking a useful object and making it useless, denying its function, uh, rejecting logic and rational thinking and resisting, totally resisting convention and authority, celebrating nonsense, irrationality, and intuition. Uh, that, that then, I mean, it's hard to actually even put that much on Dada because it's such a disorganized uh, movement. It's not, I think none of them could agree with each other about what it was. Um, out of it came surrealism, which I think really is much more deliberately um, trying to access the subconscious and to integrate it with the conscious in, in just a much, much more thoughtful, premeditated, <laughs> premeditated way, I guess. So I, it's been nice for me to have to sort of try and explain all that because it's, it's, to me, it's very confusing, the, the three sort of, there's so much overlap, but I, I think it's, 
And, and I think when I look at this piece, I associate it a lot with Merritt Oppenheim's Fur Cup. But, but that comes, uh, that's like 1938, I think. That was quite a lot later, sort of definitely classified as surrealist, where I, I think this really is more Dada. I, I have some quotes from Andre Breton's Surrealist <coughs> Manifesto, but I'll save those for the very end because I want to keep moving. Um, the, the title, I'm going to talk about the title, Cado, French for the gift. So he titles it that, um, why, why the gift? So I, I think it's that, that spontaneous idea that comes out of nowhere that really is such a gift that all creative people experience. And people want to know where does that idea come from? But I, personally, I almost never can actually say where does that idea come from. It just comes. And you sort of learn to set up the conditions in which ideas will come. But you don't really know where they come from. So to me, that's what the gift is. I think it could also be the imagination, uh, freedom, creative freedom, maybe are there ideas out there you want to throw out about what, what the title means? Anyone? <laughs> you said you think it's hostile. I mean, a lot of the words describe I know, it. yeah. He, you said he had a few drinks before he right. created it. It's called The Gift. Right. He said it was comforting. So maybe it's just fun, you know? Maybe yeah, and yeah. Like he said, he well, he definitely to... is making these objects specifically to amuse and bewilder and provoke thought. He, he, he's, he makes them as provocations. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I guess that, that's a gift. Successful. Yeah. yeah. It's a sculpture with, with geometrics. And so in that way, it can be viewed as a sculpture. Yeah. Certainly. It's a sculpture. Yeah. It's a, yeah. It sure could. Yeah. Yeah, the nails it, with his, it, related to his father. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I see a lot of his father in it. I don't know how that relates to the title, The Gift. But something, I mean, his, something that he received from his father, that was kind of like prickly pointy. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, maybe there was some gift from his father that it has some connection to. Uh, so, okay, Eduardo's going to make me talk about the vagina dentata. <laughs> I still, I'm not sure how that relates to gift, but there is a reading of this piece that sees it as a representation of the vagina dentata, which is this idea that the vagina has teeth in it that are out to get all you men. <laughs> <laughs> and I always thought that was a Freudian concept, but it really, Freud never wrote about it. It actually goes way back to folk mythology in multiple cultures, that notion. And, and so I guess you're supposed to imagine the form of the vagina and the tax as teeth. Uh, I, I don't really buy that, personally, partly because I think... Um, for him, the iron is just as much associated with his father as with his mother. I don't see this as a vagina form at all. My vagina doesn't look like that. <laughs> like, I think of the vagina as a whole. It's an opening, right? There's no opening here. And also, at the time when he was growing up, there had been an innovation in irons called Mrs. Potts Iron where the iron was more of the shape of a vagina. It had a detachable handle, so you could have a whole bunch of these metal parts on your stove, and you could, when they got cool, you could change them out. So if he wanted uh, a vagina form, he could have had one in an iron. It wouldn't be able to stand like that, but, but it, it existed, and he would have definitely grown up with it. Um, so, but also, I mean, that there's the question of what is his intention, and there's the question of what do you read into it, and those are completely different things. So I'm, I'm quite sure it was not his intention, and I'm happy if you want to read that into it. <laughs> Before... A lot of times, many of the critics go way beyond the imagination of the artist 
Yeah, and, and thank goodness they do, because sometimes the artists have very narrow vision about their own work. Yeah, yeah. All right, so I just, I wanna call attention to just a few more things. I really meant to be moving over to the other side by now, but before we leave this piece, I wanna call attention to how it was made. Because by the time he made this, this was one of an edition of 5,000 that was made in the 70s, just a few years before he died. So 50 years after that original one that was made spontaneously. And in between, he made a number of different versions of it and some other editions of it. And so, so the making of this is so completely different to me from that spontaneous first one. And he, he tried a, a lot of different actual irons, some uh, like, I've, I've seen pictures, let's say of half a dozen. So maybe the iron is leaning a little bit forward. Maybe the iron is leaning a little bit back. Maybe there's nine tacks instead of 14 or maybe there's only 13. One of them is actually an electric iron, uh, of, of quite a variety. And so by the time, you know, there you are, you're an artist getting ready to make an edition of 5,000. You're now gonna give a little bit of thought to what exactly that iron is gonna look like. So, so there's an aspect to me that's completely different about this iteration of it. And then, uh, so this is now not a found object iron, this is a fabricated iron made in a mold. And, and the way that works, there's two parts to the mold and there's a, when they pour that molten iron in, there's a, uh, a little bit of molten iron seeps out of that, that joint where the two parts come together. And so then there's a finishing process where they grind off that flashing, and you, if, if you come up and look closely, you can see uh, there's really not much attempt being made to hide that aspect. It's not finished to the degree of polish that it would have to be to actually function as an iron. It's very rough. If you tried to iron with it, even without the tacks, if you tried to iron with it, um, you know, it, it wouldn't be a good thing. <laughs> You'd shred things, even without the tacks. So he's, he's making some choices about that and keeping uh, some aspects of the original, but not all of them. It is still actual tacks actually glued on. So, you know, 5,000 times 14, somebody, I'm sure it wasn't him, glued on all those tacks. Like, yeah, crazy. Um, so I just, maybe as we're leaving, you can like come by it and just notice just how rough it is because that will come up when I do a little compare and contrast over on the other side. Uh, before we go over there, are there any more questions sort of that, that need to get answered here while we have the piece in front of us? Okay. We will Thank you. Thank you. Thank get up. Okay, so thank you for making the trek over. Get a little exercise now. Hopefully you won't fall asleep, right? Um, so, so before I, I'm not gonna tell you much about the context of this piece because I don't know much. Um, and, and before I do that, I thought let's go back to those questions that we all answered for the last piece, and let's think, how does it feel? We're talking about this hat and skull cap. What's the first word that comes to mind when you look Ultra at this religious. piece? Ultra religious. Ultra religious. What are those side locks? What are those side locks? Pristine. Pristine. How we feel looking at it? Well, the first question is how, how yeah, I don't know. How does it feel? <laughs> I'm having a hard oppressive. It feels lovely. It feels lovely. Pride. 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 Severe. Severe. Tiny. Tiny. What? One more I missed. Severe. Severe. 
The, both of them. They're, they're a pair, which I'll explain in a minute. In a minute. Yeah. Uh, and how about, uh, so I, I had a few more things on my list, light and airy, open, uh, and very ordered. Uh, how, and what about how it makes us feel? Anybody want to volunteer? Formal. Formal. Very formal. Very formal. Regal. Regal. Shaded. 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 Peaceful. Calm. Rational. <laughs> Those are on my list. Meditative. None of the above. Not peaceful or calm or rational. <laughs> And what about how would it feel? What would it feel if it were able, capable of sensation? Any thoughts that way? If this were, cap were a sentient being capable of awareness of sensation, what would it feel? Pride. Pride. It feels so happy with itself. It's exactly what it should be. <laughs> it's all happy with itself. Like it's exactly what it should be. Rational. How about transcendent? I think it's transcendent. And, and open. Distant. Huh. Elite. Correct. Yeah. It's interesting how, how some crossover with Man Ray's Kado. Not, you know, definitely some difference, but some crossover, right? Um, so, so I'll just give you a tiny little bit of context. It's a scholar's hat from the Chosun Dynasty, which is a period from 1392 to 1910, 500 years. It's a period that's known, known to foreigners as the nation of hats because there were so many different hats that signified different uh, roles in society, different class, different status. And so this is one of many, many hats that are worn in this culture. It's very specifically worn by scholars who have passed some kind of level of exam. And so it's, it's, it's conveying status. That's about all I know about it. <laughs> uh, but think about the idea of uh, form follows function. I mean, a hat is, is a form that has evolved over eons, really. I mean, thousands of years to serve some very specific functions to keep you warm, to keep the rain off, to keep the sun off. <laughs> It's not doing any of those things, right? It's obviously serving a function in that society, but it's not function the way an engineer thinks of function, right? It's a really different kind of function. It's like a mortar board, like today, a college mortar. Uh huh, yeah. It's part of a classification system. Yeah, part of a classification system. And, and like a mortar board today, that's only worn for a very specific occasion. But in that culture, this, you would have seen these a lot. And the occupation of hat maker was a very common occupation in that culture. Uh, so so I'm, I want to do a little bit of compare and contrast, because I think this idea that, that it's a form, it's a functional form, but that's not being used for that function like, think about Man Ray's Kado, where he's deliberately taking a useful object and making it useless. I mean, isn't, isn't the same thing happening here? And so completely different, like, contexts, but, but just totally fascinating. So, and so in both cases, there's, there's a form that evolved from a function. The iron also is a very specific form that, that, that hasn't changed much over many 
uh, hundreds of years. It, it has a really specific purpose and it. its form serves that purpose. So, so both of those forms, uh, in, in both cases, that function is sort of taken away and we're left with form. A form that carries meaning in this case and maybe a form in Man Ray's case that's specifically disrupting meaning. Right. And so a scholar or a samurai, they have a function that has no quantitative economic value. And there's a luxury to that. I, I thank a you for pointing that out. A thinker, I mean, how do yeah. you justify that? It's not material production. Right. And thank you also for mentioning the, the, the hair, because um, this, this skull cap on the left is it is worn under the hat, and it holds the hair in place, and then the hat perches on top of that. Very, it looks like a tiny hat, and it's because it really does not fit down over the head. If you look online, you can find illustrations that show it's, it's perched way up. And uh, the other thing I didn't say about it is they're made out of horse hair. Yeah. This, it, it's, yeah, it's astonishing to me. Uh, They're, so, so they're both objects, the hat and Man Ray's Kado. They're both objects in the sense, of, I think of an object as having a certain scale relationship to, to the physical body. In the case of the iron, of course, it's got a handle, so it relates to your hand. This is a hat, so it relates to your head. But, but just objects in general, that, that means that it has a certain scale in relation to our scale, and and I think I think that a, an object has a strong pull for that reason. The, I I looked up in the dictionary uh, the definition of object, and and I found it, there are many definitions of the word object, but it it is something physical perceived by the senses. It's something that, when viewed, stirs a particular emotion. It's also that same word object uh, is used as a target of thought, feeling, or action, like the object of study, the object of my affection. That's a term that Man Ray used to describe those Dada objects. Also, an agent for psychological identification as in the mother is the primary object of the infant. And I think in both of these cases, there's some uh, very specific formal aspects of the pieces that, that reinforce that idea of identification, both physical and psychological. And if you remember back to the, the Man Ray, that line of tax going right down the center I equate with the spine, and, and to me that's really reinforcing the bilateral symmetry of the piece that mirrors our bilateral symmetry as, as bodies, that line that goes, that divides our brain into, that divides our rib cage into, that spine that's at, at our core. I, I see that, that move, you know, he could have, there's a lot of different ways you could arrange tacks on an iron, and that's a very specific arrangement that, that I see functioning in that way. Uh, the hat actually has very delicately a, a similar sort of seam line in the front, in the back, and also at the two sides. Um, I say seam, but I have looked and looked and looked, and it, it's like, a, it's a line, but it's not a seam. Hmm. That if you look at the threads coming towards that juncture, they go right on through. It's not like two pieces being sewn together. So I'm completely mystified about how this piece was actually made. And it's not like a one-of-a-kind piece. I mean, somebody, those hat makers made a lot of these, and, and it's, it's 
amazing. So uh, another thing that you can probably see more in the skull cap is because it's got this mesh, mm -hmm. you can see through those two layers and you get this moiré pattern. You can see that pretty clearly in the skull cap, right? We're, when we see a moiré pattern, we are seeing something that does not exist physically. It, it's totally immaterial. So, so that, to me, is a formal aspect of this that is really reinforcing this, this, the immateriality of, of this hat, that it, it is really practically uh, invisible and, and immaterial and all about um, symbol. So if you put the skull cap inside the other mesh cap, does that amplify the moiré pattern or suppress it? That's a good question. Bad. Yeah. So I, I mean, I think you have to imagine that the skull cap, uh, when it's worn, is filled with hair. Oh. So you probably actually are not seeing the moiré pattern when it's worn. And maybe you would see it a little bit more in the part of the hat that projects above that, where you do see through above the hair. You also see it in those ties. These are actually ties that get tied under the, under the neck. Um, but yeah, interesting question. Uh, so I, and then I also want to bring us back to that point that I made about how Man Ray was really not hiding any of the details of fabrication in, in that piece. And, and I mean, that's such a contrast to this, which I can't tell you how it's made. It's just, it's completely mysterious to me. So there's this contrast between uh, the Man Ray that to me is just of the world and of its fabrication and, and this piece that is, I think, otherworldly and, and in an, another plane, on another plane, an object of the mind, an object of the body. And they're, and they're both basically mass produced. I mean, think about that mm -hmm. in, in relation to wh what we think is a work of art. We, we sort of don't really think about something that's really produced in that kind of quantity as a work of art, but they both, they both share that. So I guess I'm, I'm winding up here. Uh, the hats reflect so much the writing. Hmm. That's cool. The, so back to the Man Ray, those, he called them objects of his affection, were made to amuse, bewilder, and inspire reflection. But not to be confused, this, these are his words out of his autobiography, not to be confused with the aesthetic pretensions or plastic virtuosity usually expected of works of art. It's not that he's saying it's not a work of art, but he's saying, you know, it's really different. <laughs> And then the hat, which is full of pretension, really, mm -hmm. full of plastic virtuosity, and yet it's, it's an everyday object, part of everyday life. So also, you know, kind of peripheral to what, what we've been conditioned to think of as art. So uh, that's, that's about the end of my remarks. I have one quote that I want to read you. And I would like to take questions here while, while we're all gathered, if, if you want to wait for questions. Um, but I, first, I want to thank you. You've been a fantastic audience. And uh, I, I really appreciate the, the give and take. It's been wonderful. And I want to read a quote from the Irish writer, Colm Tobin. Uh, I put this on my blog if you want to go there and read it again. He says, Creating space for your own artwork involves creating space for the work that made a difference to you. This is why artists write essays. They do so to reposition the way we respond so that the work they do can be seen more clearly. And I would say that's why artists give talks. <laughs> and I hope that I've given you some new ways of thinking uh, both about these works that we've considered about my own work 
and about art in general. Thank you. I'm open to questions. You should ask us how the talk feels. Uh, uh, you can say, save that for when I have a glass of wine in my hand. There you go. <laughs> but are there any questions people would like to ask Julia? Did you have a chance to get to those for those facts? I asked, and it's not possible. I, Julia wants to know if I could get close, if I had a chance to get closer to them. I asked, I really wanted to, I really wanted to be able to touch it. And I really wanted to be able to do this, like. Because <laughs> that, that's where I really understand things and, and it just wasn't possible. Yeah, I know. Yeah, Marianne. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I guess I'll say a couple things about that. I, I set out specifically to find a textile in the collection to speak about because they do have an extensive textile background and I thought that's where, that's where I can bring my passion to this assignment. And so th this, after sort of canvassing the galleries, this was the piece that stuck with me several days later, probably uh, if you know my work, you know that I've made some objects uh, that are very sheer and lightweight and see-through and delicate and they're white. This is black, but they're, they're definitely a, a connection, yeah. Um, and I also have worked off and on starting from way back in art school with some specific objects that are kind of touchstones for me, a hammerhead, an egg, a cup, which I guess those are sort of maybe like the iron for Man Ray. So I think there is a kind of uh, pull for me that is related to that. Yeah, thanks. It's extremely precise and beautiful. Yeah, yeah. One more? Or how about a glass of wine? <laughs> Thank you.